Hello, and thank you for joining me today. This interview is part of the Cambridge Judge Business School video series, CJBS Perspectives, Leadership in Unprecedented Times. By way of a quick introduction, my name is Dr. Jenny Chu, and I'm a university lecturer at CJBS. My research primarily focuses on corporate governance and financial reporting. I'm also the academic director of the WO Plus Men's Leadership Center and deputy director of the Center for Financial Reporting and Accountability at CJBS. Today, it's an honor to be talking with Dr. Nasser Saidi, founder and president of Nasser Saidi and Associates, an economic advisory and business consultancy. Dr. Saidi has had an illustrious and wide spending career both inside and outside of Lebanon, and I will let him tell us more about it when we start the interview. Before we start, on behalf of myself and all of the CJBS community, I would like to take a moment to extend sincere sympathies to Nasser and everyone in Beirut and Lebanon affected by the devastating news of the Beirut port explosion, and to those who are facing unimaginable circumstances as a result of this disaster, our thoughts are with you. And our sincere thanks to Nasser for his generosity and openness to be interviewed at such a difficult time. Thank you, Nasser. We really appreciate your being with us today. So to start this interview, I'd like to ask you to tell us briefly about your career and about your roots in Lebanon, as well as some of the leadership roles in which you have served. Well, thank you. Thank you first for, uh, for inviting me. Um, these are very difficult times in Lebanon. You, I think the whole world has now seen the apocalyptic pictures from the Beirut port explosion which also destroyed much of the historical center of, of, of Beirut. And remember, Beirut is a city on the Mediterranean, so its history is linked to the port of Beirut throughout. And so this part of, this part of it um, has now been destroyed. And many people, of course, are in a state of shock. Those who were directly affected, and all of us, inside and outside Lebanon. So thank you for this occasion. I think it gives us time to reflect, but also to think of where we can go forward. In terms of my own career, um, I'm an economist through and through. Um, my training was, was in economics, starting in the American University of Beirut, then continuing to the UK, London School of Economics and University College, and then off to the States, uh, when I took my PhD in Rochester University, <clears throat> then started a teaching career uh, at the University of Chicago, the Department of Economics, but also taught at the uh, Graduate School of Business, as it was then called, um, in, in Chicago. Moved on to Geneva, uh, the Graduate Institute of International Studies and the University of Geneva, but gradually, more and more of my time went into consulting, mainly to governments and central banks uh, on a global basis. A lot of it was in uh, Central and Latin America, but also in the Middle East. And gradually, I went out of consulting and into banking and became a, a banker based in London. And then I got the chance to go back to Lebanon at the time it was being rebuilt after the Civil War, Rafi Hariri. Um, had just been appointed as prime minister, asked me to go back to Lebanon. I did. This was um, a turning point, really. You don't get many occasions in life to make a difference. Otherwise, you can spend the rest of your life as an economist somewhere, in a bank, at university, at the central bank, wherever. But that may not be... Um, where you want to spend the rest of your life. Um, I, I love the challenge. It was a challenge of saying, um, how many occasions in life do you get to help rebuild your country? So I went back. And it was the beginning of the period of reconstruction, starting in, in 1993. And I went into the Central Bank. I was the vice governor of Central Bank, and then became Minister of Economy and Trade, Minister of Industry, and then ended um, 11 years in public office uh, back in 2000 and 2003. Um, it was a tremendous period because um, there was, of course, many challenges, 
We had invasions by Israel. We had to undo a lot of the damage from the civil war, including rebuilding the country, rebuilding the banking sector. Uh, so it was a challenging but very rewarding period at the same time. When I ended my period in government and the central bank, um, the political situation started deteriorating and culminated, in fact, by the assassination of Rafi Hariri in 2005. But already in 2004, I started consulting and advising the Minister of Finance in the UAE, and then moved in 2005 after the assassination of Hariri to the UAE. I helped establish the Dubai International Financial Center. I was the chief strategist and chief economist of that, so effectively helped set it up for a good seven years. Um, this was again another challenge, but a very fascinating one, because this was the first time the Middle East actually developed a financial center. Um, and the challenge was we started literally with desert in, in, in Dubai. There was nothing there. So it was not only building the structures, but in putting in place the legal and regulatory structure, the laws and regulations, attracting banks and financial institutions, attracting management consultants, lawyers, and everybody in the financial services. So that was fascinating because um, you started from scratch. You had to establish credibility and build it over time. Um, and it was great because we started with 19 companies uh, back in 2004, end of 2004. By the time I left, um, we were up to 7,600. Um, so uh, very uh, interesting because out of nowhere, um, you established the financial center. The importance, of course, for the countries of the region is that they, of course, always exported capital. The GCC countries are capital exporting. And they usually send their money to be managed outside, out of London, New York, Geneva, Zurich, Singapore, and elsewhere. So this was the first time that they empowered themselves to manage and direct their own money. So that, that is the strategic importance, importance of it. So after seven years, um, it became a routine. Um, I wanted other challenges. I went back to my own consulting, which is what I do now. I do mainly um, governments, central banks and the like, but I also have a non quite a bit of non-for-profit um, non, non activity. I established a Clean Energy Business Council uh, back in 2012. At a time, nobody was really talking about clean energy, clean technology. This was really to support and help uh, the countries invest in, in clean energy. I also established a institute, the Haukama Institute for Corporate Governance, something that should interest you, Jenny, because you're, you're, you're very much in that field. Again, the, the, the reason for that is that when I was a central bank governor, uh, many of the problems that we faced were problems of government, related party lending, um, all sorts of issues in banking. At the core of them, they were always corporate governance issues. So to me, corporate governance is basic to, to banking, finance, and business activity in general. And I also set up a Mudara Institute of, Di an Institute of Directors, which we called Mudara. Um, so I'm involved in quite a bit of activity into fintech, into incubators, accelerators in Lebanon through Veritech, which uh, is part of the St. Joseph University in Beirut, one of the oldest universities in Beirut. So um, it's, been a, it's, it's been an interesting combination in and out of the public sector, um, but the string which keeps them all together uh, is my love of economics. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I mean, this is such a wonderful career that spans uh, academia to government to private practice. And I think you can really help us uh, bring everything together about what's happened in Lebanon and about the strategic importance of everything that's just happened. And with that, um, 
My first question is, Beirut has always been considered the Paris of the Middle East with bustling tourism and commerce. But this tragic explosion comes during an already very difficult time for Lebanon during an economic crisis and obviously a global pandemic. Could you please help us put things in perspective and help us understand why the economy descended into crisis? And then also, what is the economic impact of this tragic explosion? Well, you need to understand that you have a series of crises. It's not just a, a economic crisis. It's also a banking and financial crisis. It's a currency crisis. And because of COVID, it's a health crisis. And on top of all that, you've got the Beirut port explosion. Let's go back a little bit to understand why it is that Lebanon got here. The fundamental reason is that um, after the war, uh, Lebanon continued running deficits, budget deficits. Part of that was to build infrastructure. But later on, it simply became to borrowing to cover current spending without any buildup of assets. You had continuous budget deficits and at the same time, continued current account deficits, basically consuming much more than your earning and borrowing from the rest of the world. So large current account deficits, large budget deficits, those twin deficits led to a large buildup of debt. And now that is about $100 billion. Just to put that in perspective, we expect the debt to GDP ratio to be about 185% of GDP. That's the second biggest and the highest in the world after Japan and now surpassing Greece. So that puts it in perspective. So more than 50%, 50% of government revenue would just be going to pay interest on the public debt. So that, that is how big the fiscal problem. So the budget deficit, current account deficit became unsustainable. And at the same time, the central bank tried to maintain fixed exchange rates. It pegged the exchange rates. But in order to peg the exchange rate at a time which, which you're running large budget deficits and your credit worthiness is declining, it had to pay higher and higher interest rates. But the higher and higher interest rates added to the cost of debt service. So it meant increased borrowing costs, costs for government. Then the central bank, in order to attract more deposits from the rest of the world, um, effectively began a Ponzi scheme back in 2015. My Ponzi scheme was the fact that they paid increasingly higher interest rates to banks to deposit with the central bank, which they then used to finance government. So you have three balance sheets which are linked together. The government's balance sheet, effectively a bankrupt government that could no longer pay its debt, the commercial bank's balance sheet, which was full of government debt. 70% of their assets was government debt and central bank debt. And then the third balance sheet was the central bank's balance sheet, which was borrowing from the banks <laughs> to finance government. And effectively, that Ponzi scheme was a case in which the bank, central bank started borrowing simply to pay the interest it owed on commercial bank borrowing. And eventually, like in all Ponzi schemes, it bursts. So by summer last year, by September last year, uh, they had a, what we call a sudden stop. Investors, and these were mainly Lebanese, so that people understand the much of the debt of Lebanon is held by Lebanese, Lebanese banks and the Lebanese diaspora, which over time invested into Lebanon into deposits and into investments and treasury bills in Lebanon. When you had the sudden stop, it meant that people started withdrawing their deposits instead of the inflow of deposits. And when that happened, the central bank and the banks went into panic. They had a holiday, they shut down the banks, and that of course triggered the crisis. You should never and that is a major lesson. You never shut down the banks because when you shut down the banks and take a banking holiday, that 
it means mistrust and breaking of confidence. And as a result of that, the next step was they imposed informal capital controls. That meant you could no longer transfer money outside. You could no longer move in and out of the Lebanese pounds. So you could no longer have access to, to dollars and to your dollar deposits freely. And in a highly dollarized system, more than 70% of the deposits in the banking system were in foreign currency, mainly in US dollars. And when you imposed capital controls and controls on payments, effectively that meant a credit squeeze and a liquidity squeeze, which then meant that business could no, no longer function. Uh, you no longer had the proper credit cycle. You could no longer import from the rest of the world. And so all your trade financing also stopped. And as a result of that, <laughs> you went into this downward spiral. So just to give an idea of how severe the crisis is, we're expecting a decline in real GDP of around 25% this year. That is worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s. At the same time, with the, we've had a collapse of the exchange rate because the central bank had used up most of its reserves and could no longer support the peg. The currency went into a free fall, declining by some 80% over the past nine months. At the same time, there's strong pass through from the exchange rate to inflation. So inflation by July of this year was over 100% and 20% per month. So you now have a combination of a deep depression close to hyperinflation. Once you start approaching 50%, you're talking about hyperinflationary conditions. And of course, uh, the depression of business meant high unemployment. The unemployment rate is now running at 35% and moving north. And of course, the combination of all that means increasing poverty. We now estimate the poverty rate of Lebanese is in excess of 50% of the population. The food poverty rate, i.e. people who can barely ensure their food is now running at 25% of the population. So to sum it up, you've got a currency crisis, you've got a banking and financial crisis, a debt crisis, and a humanitarian crisis. This is unprecedented in history <clears throat> because normally countries have a currency crisis, some of them have a debt crisis, some of them have a banking crisis. Lebanon has combined all those. I think historically maybe only 1% of cases or 2% of cases at best are like that. So that gives you a little bit of the dimensions of, of, of the economic problems that Lebanon is facing. And now it's culminated, you already had a humanitarian crisis, but now with the explosion of the port of Beirut, um, all those crises that I mentioned have been aggravated. You have a destruction of infrastructure of the port. Um, you have a destruction of the historical um, part, of, part of Beirut which is also the cultural center of Beirut. Much of our heritage buildings going back 200, 300, 400 years are in that part. They did not survive the blast. So we've got something like 50,000 houses and apartments that are either destroy destroyed or partially destroyed. You've got schools and universities, hospitals also in that area, damaged or destroyed. So you've got several impacts. Uh, first, your ability to import from the rest of the world has been affected because you destroyed a good part of the port. Lebanon imports seven, some 75% of all its requirements and 85% of its food. The grain silos in the port were destroyed. So you're no longer, you only have a little bit of grain left in the country to feed the population. <clears throat> 
so transport and logistics are severely affected. Then you have the educational center, the educational sector, the health sector, the cultural sector, and of course government has also got affected because the port is also the main source of revenue apart from VAT, customs revenue. So now government has been losing revenue all out throughout this year because of the decline in, in, in income. But now also with the loss of customs revenue, it's meant that the deficit is, is rising. So budget deficit this year is probably going to be another 11% of GDP. Government can no longer borrow. Nobody will lend the government of Lebanon, given the circumstances. So central bank is financing the government by printing money. But of course, when the central bank prints, prints paper <laughs> to finance budget deficits, that only leads to an acceleration of deficits and further currency depreciation. So that is the situation that Lebanon currently faces, a combination of a humanitarian crisis, health crisis, economic currency, debt, and banking crisis. Unprecedented. Thank you so much. That was so insightful. And um, I wonder now, given your analysis, do you think that Lebanon is becoming a failed state? I think that unless you have deep reforms and immediate reforms urgently, Lebanon will become what I call Libazuela. Yeah. Yeah close to being a Venezuelan example, where you'll have um, mass migration of people. And once you have mass migration, the only people who get left behind um, are the old people, the people who have no capacity or ability to find somewhere else to go. And that leads to an implosion, yeah? and to more social and political unrest. We've already seen protests start again after the port, the explosion on the port. I think this will accelerate unless we have, uh, unless we have immediate reforms. And that means if that doesn't happen, then what you're talking about is a failed state. You're talking about maybe a decade of Lebanon uh, going into increased depression, um, social, political unrest throughout. So speaking of reforms, to get back on its feet, what do you think is needed to happen within Lebanon? And also, what does the country need from the international community? Well, that, that is, is well known. The, the Jab government um, came into power uh, back in February earlier this year. <clears throat> as a result of protest and dissent, which led to the resignation of the Hariri government in January. The protest started in October, wanting reform. A reform against a system which was corrupt of politicians that had used government spending, captured the state, captured the regulator, the central bank in particular, and used much of the money not to build infrastructure or to build assets, but to finance current spending. Usually, it's okay to borrow if you build up assets against that. Lebanon did not build assets. It did not build the infrastructure. It just went into current spending. And the warlords that were involved in the 1975-1990 war simply captured the state. And their people, they entered their people into government, into the army, into the security services. So they took the burden of financing off them and put it onto the state, onto government. So what you need to do is to restructure government. You need to reduce the size of government because much of it is incompetent, waste, bribery, nepotism, and cronyism. So you need to do a restructuring of government and particular of the state-owned enterprises. 
So structural change. So it's not just macroeconomic, monetary, and fiscal policy. You need structural change, structural reforms. How do structural reforms happen, though, when there are interested parties um, involved? Well, yes, that, that, that's a very good question. And the Jab government failed because the politicians refused to accept the reforms that were required because it would have uncovered all the corruption <laughs> underlying government procurement, government contracts, the electricity sector. So for example, Lebanon for the past 10 years has been having a deficit because of the electricity du Liban, the power sector, at around one and a half, two billion dollars per year, right? Continuous, and we still don't have electricity. Why? Because the politicians arranged to have barges in the sea to supply electricity, and they made lots of money on the contracts. They made lots of money on the supply of diesel and fuel for the barges to supply electricity. But there's still no electricity left. So you only have two or three hours of electricity per day on average across Lebanon. So the types of reforms that you need are Fiscal reform, reduce the budget deficit, improve revenue, cut down subsidies, for example, to electricity. At the same time, um, you need monetary policy reform. You can no longer continue with the pegged exchange rate. Already you have multiple exchange rates. You need to move to a unified exchange rate, a flexible exchange rate. You need to have formal capital controls because at the moment, you have informal capital controls. And as we know from many countries that have informal capital controls, that is always subject to abuse. <laughs> if I have access to a friendly banker and I get my manage to get my money out, um, I will do it. Other people may not. So you have multiple exchange rate, which create distortions in the market. So you need, you need to reform that. At the same time, you need to restructure the banking sector because a lot of the debt owed by government cannot be repaid. If you look at the price of Lebanese euro bonds, they're now worth 20 cents on the dollar. So any holder of debt faces an 80% loss. And that's mainly the banks, as well as the central bank. So restructuring the debt means restructuring the banking sector, but also restructuring the central bank. The losses made by the central bank as a result of the Ponzi scheme are estimated to be in excess of $50 billion. So just to put that in perspective, that's about the size of GDP in 2019. I know of no central bank in the world which has run a Ponzi scheme, which has made losses equivalent to 100% of GDP. So you're going to have to restructure of the central bank and its finances, its balance sheet. Thank you so much for these insights. Now, given that our series is CJBS Perspectives Leadership in Unprecedented Times, I wonder what sort of leadership is then needed to rebuild the Lebanese economy and to make these recommendations happen? Well, I summarize it by saying, uh, <clears throat> You need, you need at the moment a new government. Uh, currently there are discussions going on to form a new government. What you need is a Harakiri government. What I mean by that is you're going to have to have ministers in there who are kamikazes, who are willing to sacrifice their political future, but undertake deep and unpopular reforms, as we, as we were mentioning. That means you're not going to survive. Yeah, you're going to have to remove subsidies, um, cut down spending, restructure the banking sector, and all of that. Now, the politicians, of course, who have been, been major beneficiaries of the system over the years, will, will not willingly allow that. So what you need are ministers who are politically independent, non-partisan, Let's call them technocrats for want, for want of a better word. But rather than just technocrats, they have to be experts who know 
public policy. You know how to get things done. Not purely medical, in other words. But second, you need international support. So in answer to your question, you need two types of international support. Lebanon, in effect, needs a Marshall Plan, estimated at around 25 to 30 billion, to which you need to add another 15 billion as a result of the explosion of Beirut port. So you're talking about 45 to 50 billion. That is feasible on condition that you undertake reforms. So the IMF, World Bank, international community, European Union, UK, US, China, and others, and the Gulf countries, which have a very important role to play, are willing to help Lebanon. But they understand the depth of corruption that exists in Lebanon. So they have had a very clear message, which President Macron, who visited uh, Beirut two days after the explosion, said very clearly, there will be no aid and financial support unless there are reforms. Of course, there's going to be humanitarian aid, a package of around maybe 300 million. And that, of course, is necessary. And it needs to go directly to the NGOs and the beneficiaries. It should not pass through government. Because if it passes through government, it'll just go into private pockets. So apart from the humanitarian aid, what you need is a package. Let's call it a reconstruction and stabilization package, right? Reconstructing Beirut, but also other infrastructure, electricity, transport, and other. And then you need for macroeconomic stabilization to help you rebuild the banking sector, to provide liquidity so that you, Lebanon can import again, get the wheels of commerce, and business going again, so that you can start creating jobs in the private sector to invest. So all of that package is around 50 billion, yeah? which the international community has to come, come up with. But again, the international community should not do that unless there are reforms. I'm sorry to say it, but I'm Lebanese, I'd love to get 50 billion. But if it's going to go into more debt, which I would call odious debt, already a lot, a good part of our debt is what I would call odious debt, which we shouldn't recognize because it was contracted by corrupt politicians. We should not do that. So the international community should be very clear. There should be clear conditionality. You undertake reforms, we provide the financing. You don't undertake reforms, there is no financing. But it's not going to be that easy, we know that. So what you need to do is to impose, you need to provide incentives. You have to tell the politicians that I will sanction you personally. I will go after your assets outside, your deposits and your investments, whether they be in London, Paris, New York, or Zurich, or anywhere else, I will freeze them if you don't undertake the reforms. So it has to be very clear. There has to be a carrot and stick here. Uh, but the stick has to be a big stick. Understood. Um, and do you see availability of leaders that, um, I think, I love this term, kamikaze leaders. Do, do, do you see people who are qualified and who would undertake these types of roles? Yes, yes, because um, Lebanon is exceptional in the Middle East and that it's always invested in, in human capital. But also given the small size of the country and the economy, we've also export, always exported our people to the rest of the world. So you'll see there are four times as many Lebanese outside Lebanon as there are within Lebanon. They're into banking and finance, they're into education, they are all over. They are entrepreneurs and are known to be very successful entrepreneurs. That Lebanese diaspora has the talent, knowledge, and is in many ways is exceptional and is willing to help. They have, although they lost a lot of their money because of 
the Ponzi scheme and the millennial financial crisis, I think they would want to help Lebanon rebuild itself. So I think if you had the reforms and you have formal capital controls, so if I send my money in, it is protected and not subject to informal controls by the banks and central bank. If you did that, then I think you'd attract a lot of the Lebanese back to help rebuild the country. And they have access to the technology, they have access to financing, they know the Arab world extremely well, because Lebanon has to work within its neighborhood. Its neighborhood means linking up to Europe and linking up to the Gulf countries and to the rest of the Middle East. We know how to do that. Um, as I always used to say, if you have a problem in a bank in Sudan, say, who would you send? Uh, you'd send the Lebanese banker to, to sort it out. Um, so the talent is there. I, I have no, no questions about it. But even more important, we know how to fix problems. In other words, given the reforms that I mentioned, we have people who know how to undertake the reforms because we've been doing that in other countries. Uh, many Lebanese, for example, have been in the Gulf countries for the past 20, 30 years. Uh, when the trouble started, many of them left. Um, they've been doing nothing but helping other countries build themselves, whether it's in Africa, the Gulf countries, into Latin America, as far as Australia and, and other. So we know how to do it. Uh, what we need is the politicians to let us do it. Well, on that note, the Lebanese are indeed famed for their resilience rebuilding after years of civil war, invasion, and foreign occupation. Do you then see any light at the end of the tunnel? The answer is yes. Um, this, despite, and I've lived it very closely, okay? I've been in government, outside government. Um, I continue to be, I'm an, I'm an activist right now in wanting to see reform and change happen in, in Lebanon. When I see the activities of our NGOs, um, and the Lebanese diaspora is helping people rebuild their homes, uh, providing food and health uh, aid, um, they're active at, at all levels. So that, that leaves me optimistic. And occasionally in life, and also in the life of countries, when you have major events, such as the explosion of the port of Beirut, it changes things radically. So post 4th of August 2020 is different from pre 4th of August 2020. And the reason is that the wall of fear that people had from their political leadership and this corruption has been broken. Um, they now have nothing to lose, right? They, they're, they're unemployed, their homes have been destroyed, their children killed, their hospitals, education, schools, universities, all the rest. They have nothing to lose. The only thing they have to lose is the political leadership, which is corrupt and incompetent, which got them there. So I think the protests are going to continue. Uh, I think they will accelerate until you get really a, a big change. So this is a moment of, of transformation. Of course, um, moments of transformation can be also destroyed. In other words, governments can use repressive force. And we've seen that after the explosion of the port of Beirut where the security services and indeed the army repressed protests in the streets. That could still happen. That could still happen. It means that you might have more bloody protests and more violence. It may be that they will prevail. If I wanted to take a bet, I would say that between external intervention, i.e., the international community coming in and saying, here is the carrot, namely we'll help you rebuild. Here's the stick, we will impose sanctions on you. And between domestic 
protests and a lot of young people who are willing to play a political role right in 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 those civil action groups i think i'm hopeful that we will we will effect change our problem of course is that we're also talking about geopolitical geopolitical circumstances that are not helping lebanon um there is a confrontation between the united states and its allies and iran and its allies in the region and the fulcrum of that confrontation happens to be in lebanon because of the presence of hezbollah so lebanon is at the center of that confrontation what we need to make sure with the international community is that it doesn't become the victim of that confrontation thank you that was so interesting um i would like to sincerely thank nasser again for joining us you have shared such informed and moving insights on why the lebanese economy descended into crisis and what the beirut explosion means for the lebanese people and economy it has been a privilege to connect with you and i greatly appreciate your participating in cjbs perspectives leadership in unprecedented times we at cjbs appreciate all of you who have joined us today to discuss and hear this important topic with nasser all of our most sincere thoughts and prayers as the country endeavors to recover. Thank you. Thank you.